Blog Talk Radio. Close all university departments for black, Latino, women, gender, queer studies, and so forth as incompatible with science and dismiss its faculties as intellectual imposters or scoundrels. As well, demand that all affirmative action commissars, diversity and human resource officers from universities on down to schools and kindergartens be thrown out onto the street and be forced to learn some useful trade. Six, crush the anti-fascist mob. The transvaluation of all values throughout the West, the invention of ever more victim groups, the spread of affirmative action programs, and the relentless promotion of political correctness has led to the rise of an anti-fascist mob, tacitly supported and indirectly funded by the ruling elites this self-described mob of social justice warriors has taken upon itself the task of escalating the fight against white privilege through deliberate acts of terror directed against anyone and anything deemed racist, right-wing, fascist, reactionary, incorrigible, or unreconstructed. Such enemies of progress are physically involved, but Uh, good evening. This is Clifton Knox, uh, back with Punching In, and I'm joined by my co-host, David German, and a uh, very special honored guest, uh, Stefan Kinsella. How are you doing, Stefan? I'm doing wonderful. How are you doing? Doing great. Um, David, you're doing well, I assume. We, we were just talking, and you jumped off, jumped back on. Um, and I'll have to excuse us out there if we're, you're experiencing any you know, we're having any sound issues or anything that you're noticing. Um, it is Blog Talk Radio. Um, but, uh, Stefan, uh, you are currently the director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom does? Well, I'm a, um, I'm a patent attorney in Houston by trade, and I've been a longtime libertarian um, writer and, 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 uh, and uh, aficionado of the Austrian School of Economics, a follower of, of Rothbard and Hoppe and Mises. I'm an anarcho-capitalist, and uh, yeah, I've been doing that for quite a while. I edit libertarian papers, a journal which I founded, uh, sort of the successor to – the Journal of Libertarian Studies, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I think we're going to talk about argumentation, ethics, and related rights type theories, which has been one of my main interests for about 20 plus years. So yeah, I'm happy to talk about this stuff. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, well, yeah, we're very ex- excited to have you on to, to speak with us about this tonight. Um, I guess one of the one of the things I'm uh, very interested in is uh, – your explanation to hear hear uh, your take on argumentation ethics. I think that you probably have one of the best interpretations out there, and uh, obviously you you know and speak to Hoppe uh, quite a bit. So maybe you could uh, sort of lay down the basics of what it is for us. Sure. Uh, for different libertarian audiences, you know, you would approach us different ways, but most libertarians at least implicitly believe in rights, right? We talk about property rights and our individual rights and our constitutional rights. And rights is really a legal term. It just, it basically means um, the legally justified or sanctioned right or ability to control a resource. So this arises from the fact that people in acting in the world, when there's more than one person in the world, could potentially have a conflict with each other for the use of their standing room or the land or their bodies or the scarce resources that they want to use. So the very phenomena of conflict is what gives right to the need people. Okay. 
a rightful owner of a resource. All right. And so um, how do you feel that – or do, do you feel that it does even relate to, for instance, the non-aggression principle in any way? And do you think they play into each other at all? Absolutely. So, um, so I'm, I'm so I'm just explaining where the where the term rights itself comes from, um, and why people use this kind of concept. So they use it when they're trying to have a some negotiated or peace resolution of a possible dispute or conflict among people. Now, the the primary way that this could happen would be a naked or a transparent or a clear act of aggression. Aggression would be. Basically, when one person attacks another person, so physically I'm using my body to attack your body. So in that case, we're having a dispute over something that's motivating us, but we're fighting physically over our bodies. Like I want you to do something that you're not doing, and I'm going to take control of your body and stab objects into it or try to kill it without your consent. Right? That's what aggression is. So aggression is a violent clashing of two human actors – over something that can be clashed over, which is their bodies in the primal case. So when we say non-aggression, we mean that because we're humans and we've developed um, certain civilized tendencies and we have society, we live among each other, and we have values outside of our naked self-interest. We, we care for other people. We care for the human race. We care for our tribe. We care for our community. We have empathy for other people. We care about things other than ourselves, and we care about justifying our actions. And all this results in this complicated interplay between people and society where they have rules among each other, rules that everyone understands are the rules that we've agreed to in some sense to allow us to live with each other in peace and harmony and cooperation rather than always fighting each other like like naked self-interest brute beasts so non-aggression principle by itself just means the idea that you don't have the justified right to hit someone or attack their body unless they started it you don't have the right to initiate force but that is really just a, uh, a shorthand for the entire body of rules that libertarians believe in that's just one part of it because we also believe in the rights to property rights and that you shouldn't trespass and that you should return someone's property if you take it. And you should be forced to do so if necessary, that there's a right to self-defense, that threats are unjustified, etc. All these things are workings out of the basic core idea right? That we, that most of us prefer to live in peace and prosperity with each other and to find rules that allow us to live together in peace and harmony. Um, and the core rule would be the non-aggression principle, but in a sense, the non-aggression principle is just a shorthand for a more complicated set of property rights rules. Okay, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And so, I guess argumentation ethics it kind of also kind of, in, in some regards. I mean, some some libertarians, even some anarcho-capitalists, are are consequentialists. They're not really a natural rights, natural law type libertarians. Of course. I've always been under the impression that you were a natural law uh, uh, libertarian, at least mostly. Um, and would that be a correct assumption? Well, I would explain it a little bit. It would take a little while to explain it differently, and we could do so if you like. Um, um, I think you first have to understand what it means to have rules, and then we have to understand what the libertarian rules are. Just what they are, like what we believe in, and then the question arises as to which rules are justified. When we say justified, we mean which which types of arguments can be adduced or presented that favor the rules we prefer rather than those other people prefer. Why we prefer them may be a question of sociology or psychology or human history or anthropology or evolution, um, but the question mm -hmm. is how do we justify these rules? And in libertarian theory. And in human history, and in, you know, kind of proto-libertarian thinking, classical liberalism, um, there have been different strands of thought. And the traditional thinking right now is that you could separate people into two different camps. 
One approach would be the natural law approach, right, or the natural rights approach, or some mm -hmm. call it the natural right approach. And then others think in terms of consequences or utilitarianism. Um, and there's a presumption sometimes that these things are in, in conflict with each other, like these types of arguments um, uh, contradict each other. You have to choose one or the other. Um, and then there are people that have a third or even a fourth option, right? Like uh, uh, J.C. Lester, Jan Lester, who's an anarchist libertarian thinker, rejects these things. Uh, he rejects both approaches and has something um, based upon like Popper's theory of uh, – like he rejects justification in general. But I'd say the general approach would be we want to have rules that, that – do the greatest good for the greatest number. That's utilitarianism. Or you could put it more generally to have the best consequences for people in terms that we all agree with in general terms like welfare, prosperity, food, shelter, prosperity. Um, and then the second approach would be more of a Kantian deontological approach, which is the idea that there are certain things that you just cannot do no matter what, right? And you should respect these mm -hmm. principles. Um, I, I'm not of the view that these views are in conflict with each other. I'm vice versa. So I think that what it, the, the general types of rules that we ought to adopt as human beings to live among each other, to produce these general right. So this consequentialism would be the types of rights that natural thinkers also uh, argue for. Um, now, the argumentation ethics approach is an approach um, advanced by Hans Hermann Hoppe, who was a who's an Austrian. Uh, well, he's German himself. He's an Austrian thinker in the mold of Rothbard and Mises, and an, an, an anarcho-capitalist. And he's a radical anarchist, but his view of rights is not the same as the traditional Lockeans or natural rights. People. In fact, he has some criticisms of those types of arguments. Um, what is ought gap that you can't deduce a norm or an ought or a should statement? Like you can't deduce a moral statement from an is or a factual statement. You can't say that just because that thing is the way it is, therefore we should treat it this way. Um, that there's a logical gap when you go from an is to an ought. That was sort of the, the criticism of Hume, David Hume. And Hoppe right. said, okay, that might be a fair criticism. Let's find another way to justify these norms without falling afoul of the is ought gap. And what Hans Hermann Hoppe did was he studied under uh, some German philosophers like Jurgen Habermas and Karl Otto Appel, who were socialists, but their theory inspired him, and he combined that with insights of Mises. So that's the Austrian economics. Uh, uh, economist and Mises' human action and praxeology ideas and Rothbard's radical libertarianism. And Hans argues that the best way to justify the libertarian norm, right, is to use the uh, an approach similar to Habermas and Appel, which is argumentation ethics, which is not to say that we have a nature and it's this and therefore we should do that. But instead, it's to say that when every norm you would ever seek to ju justify would have to be justified in the course of some kind of discourse or interplay between people and argumentation. And to recognize that that activity itself is a practical activity which has certain normative presuppositions. That's sort of the core of his argument. What he's saying is that you c it's impossible to have a civilized discussion with someone. To try to argue that you have the right to kill them, basically, or to enslave them, because <laughs> when seems, you're having a civil kind of argument with someone, yeah, well, there's presupposition. So it's an it, it's it's a complicated or nuanced way of, of 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 making that kind of argument. But he's basically saying that you could never make an argument, a real sincere argument, that you should dominate someone else because. If you're going to dominate them, you're not trying to argue with them. You're not trying to persuade them by the force of reason. You, you, and, and, and this is why it's so important that he emphasizes over and over again, which is lost on a lot of his critics. 
he says that the one of the most profound aspects of this is the recognition that when people enter into a sincere, honest disagreement, um, they agree to disagree. And what that means is they're agreeing to walk away if they can't persuade each other by the force of reason. Or to put it another way, they're both agreeing to try to persuade each other by the force of reason, not by a, not by coercion or by that. That is a other domain. They're sort of respecting each other's rights to their bodies because that's the implicit presupposition of saying, I can't you my position, then I'm not going to attack you. Well, why would you say that? Because you have the right to your body. I have the right to my body. But that implicit recognition is the core of the libertarian philosophy. So that's kind of where Hoppe is going with his argumentation ethics. Okay. So, so in a lot of ways, it's, it really kind of uh, stands uh, outside of some of this stuff and, and really more or less on its own, I, I guess, is what, kind of what I'm taking away from this. Um, can't really pin it down into, into, into any one of the particular camps that you were mentioning earlier. Well, he, specific, he, he denies that he's consequentialist, um, and he denies that he's bridging the is ought gap, which David Hume showed is logically unbridgeable, which the natural law people uh, try to do. And he also criticizes natural law thinking because, number one, it tries to bridge this gap. It tries to go from an is to an ought, and also because human nature is very vague and very diffuse, and you can only get so much from human nature. I mean… Humans are very adaptable animals, and we're not limited but to our instincts like dogs or, or, or other animals. So to say that our nature is to do A, B, and C, you can do whatever you want in your life, really. So it, it's, you can't get too much from the general fact that we have reason and that we want to you know, survive in the world because there's any number of ways to do that. So I think he would set himself apart. Uh, some people call it… There are different names for this, um, so I, I guess in my mind I would distinguish maybe four or five strands of arguments for libertarianism. Um, in fact, maybe you could have a six, which is zero. Was like some libertarians have no argument; they just go by intuition or what they value. They don't really have a good argument for libertarianism. I guess some are religious; they think that it's a result of the, the edicts of the Bible or God or Jesus or something like that, right? Like James Redford, who says that Jesus was an anarchist or whatever. So I guess you could have mystical or religious arguments or authoritative arguments, um, and then you have the common sense practical, like what works, what works. But that presupposes a common set of goals, so that's the utilitarian or consequentialism, mm -hmm. and I would view consequentialism as the main type of argument people have, which is a practical type of argument, a pragmatic argument, and utilitarianism, would, I would view that as a subset of consequentialism. And then you have the natural law or the natural rights arguments, right? which is that uh, because of the way nature is or the way God commands it, um, it follows that there are certain ways that we should act. There are certain ways you should act in your life. And actually, personally, I'm not that critical of that um, from a life perspective. Like I think that our nature does indicate to us the ways that we should live a life, a good life. So the Aristotelian idea… The natural law idea, the classical idea, um, I think has a lot of wisdom behind it. But it's not like it's opposed in a polar way to consequentialism. All this stuff dovetails with the and so I, I think that the rights that we have, or the rights that we could justify, just being values. Most people have that engage in these. Right. So, um, are you still there, Stefan? Yeah. Uh, you seem like you're breaking up a little yeah. bit, honestly. Uh, blog talk radio. No, I'm right here. <laughs> okay, fantastic, fantastic. I thought you broke up there for us for a second. Um, why, well, uh, David? Oh, sorry uh, about that. Did, did you? Uh, that's okay. That's that's fine. I mean, it, it happens on here. It's one of the reasons we talked about, you know, earlier. Um, David, did you have any questions that you would like to to uh, lay out there for for Stefan to answer? 
can you give us the background on uh, Estoppel? Uh, I think we lost Stefan. Maybe he'll come back in. Um, I think he dropped off. Uh, uh, we were we were breaking up pretty bad, having some technical difficulties. But uh, to this point, I'm hoping he'll come back. We'll, we'll get him back here in just a second. Um, uh, very interesting stuff that he's that he's been telling us. I mean, a, a very very interesting what he had to say so far, and some of the background that he's given us on on Hoppe's, uh argumentation ethics. When you say David, oh yes, yeah, I was waiting for that question that it came to me, and then it. And then, then he went away. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Did, did, did it, were, were you uh, were you having um, were you having any any difficulty with him breaking up, or was it just me that was? I heard. Yeah, it was it, everything was pretty much blip, 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 up for a minute. Okay. Well, like I said, I, I hope we can get he comes back on in a minute, and that we we can get him back in here for for the next uh, uh, thirty minutes or so of the show before. Time's up, but I thought it was extremely interesting. He was talking about um, the fact that uh, Hoppe studied under uh, Jurgen Habermas. Uh, I know that Paul Gottfried yeah. also studied under Marcusa. And and you think about that, both of those guys were in the Frankfurt School. So I mean, it's interesting how how much influence you see. There's some influence there, obviously, uh, in, into libertarianism, anarcho-capitalism, and so on from from uh, the Frankfurt School even. Um, but, uh, well, um, so you were getting ready to ask him about Estoppel, and we lost him. There he is. Like, I think like, he's back on. Hang on a second. Is that you, Stefan? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear so. you. David, it just just asked you uh, for a little bit of background on, on Estoppel. Sorry, I don't know what happened, but uh, I'm back on my phone now. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you, and, and uh, we're sorry about the, the sound quality issues. Uh, we're we're going to work on improving nope. this over the next six months. So, Got it. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't know what I cut out. but um, um, No, estoppel is, is kind of the, the way I frame my approach to, to rights theory uh, to rights, uh, and I, I thought of this when I was in law school, coming across a common law concept called estoppel, which is, which is a legal doctrine, which is a way that a, a court can prevent someone from saying something that might be true or might otherwise be a normal claim you could make, but, um, but it's inconsistent with something you did earlier that the other side in your dispute relied upon. And so the court says, look, it's just not fair for you to maintain two inconsistent positions, so we're not going to let you say the second position. So you can't say that – like you can't let, – let, let me give an example. You come home, and your neighbor has hired some company to paint their fit, their, their house, okay? And the, the painting company shows up at the wrong house. They show up at your house on accident. They make a mistake. And they start painting your house, and you see them doing this. Now, you know they're making a mistake, and you, you think, oh, well, I'm not going to say a word. I'm going to let them paint my house. I'll get a free paint job, and there's no contract between me and them. And therefore, um, when, they, when they ask me to pay them, I'll deny it, and if they sue me for breach of contract, I can honestly say we didn't have a contract. So I just sit back, and I let them paint my house by mistake, right? Um, so a regular court in law – and this is in England where this evolved um, – would, would say that you would win because there's no contract, because there was no consideration. There was no meeting of the minds. There was no agreement. It was a mistake by the painter. But then the painter might see you in a court of equity, which has to do with fairness, and it's like a last resort. You go to the king to ask for relief you know, in the king's courts if, if there's some manifest injustice, injustice being done. That's what equity means, right? Fairness. And in, in equity, they developed the doctrine of estoppel, and they would say that it is true that you didn't have a contract, but we're not going to prevent you. We're not going to allow you to say that. We're going to stop you or prevent you from. We're going to prevent you from making that defense 
So when the guy says you have a contract, you can't have a defense against it because that would be inconsistent with the way you acted. When you showed up and you let him paint in your house, you acted as if you had a contract. So you, so when I heard of this doctrine, which is just a legal doctrine, you, know, you can agree with it or disagree with it. Um, then you know, um, I thought that's similar to the symmetry in the libertarian idea, right? The libertarian non-aggression principle, which is the idea that we're not against force or violence even. We're just against the initiation. So what we say is that you can't start the use of force, but you can use it in response to force. So that's the libertarian idea is that responsive force is permissible… And again, I'm talking about the naked case of one body against another, one person attacking another. You know, Property rights and trespass and things like that are more complicated, but the kernel of our idea is that you can't start the use of force. You have to respect each other's bodily property rights. So it just occurred to me that this is kind of the way that the libertarian principle works, is that what we're saying is you can use force only in response to force. Can't initiate it. So there's a symmetry there. So in other words, in the legal language, you could say that if someone if someone commits an act of aggression, they start force, and then the the the, the victim tries to respond or to retaliate. You can't criticize what they're doing because you'd be stopped from doing so because it would be inconsistent with your own behavior. In other words, if you act as if it's okay for people to stab each other's bodies or to use each other's bodies like means, then you can't be heard to object to that rule being applied to you. So it's a very common sense rule. It's, it's kind of implicit in the biblical rule of um, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you know, lex talionis, and lots mm-hmm. of other common sense wisdom over the ages. And I think that's the root of the libertarian idea too is that it's like the porcupine idea. You know, You leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. Well, we're not pacifists. We don't, we don't believe that you have to be a pacifist. You can respond with violence, but only in response to violence, and that is the essence of the libertarian non-aggression principle. So I saw in this legal into intuitive principle of estoppel, this equity principle of estoppel, that there was a way I could spin that and work it into a way to define and defend what, what human rights are. And so I did that, and I think it borrows and complements Hoppe's argumentation ethics approach as well. Okay. That, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's brilliant. Um, David, do you have any other questions that you would like to ask, Stefan? Uh, going back to um, um, argumentation ethics, um, how would um, argumentation presuppose self-ownership? Well, because the idea is that what a genuine argumentation is a, a, a real discussion between two or more people about trying to solve a matter of truth. Like, so we have in front of us a dispute or a disagree. If, if everyone agrees, there's no possible dispute, and no one ever has a problem. So these things only happen when there's a dispute, a disagreement, and we're we're trying to come together to find a rule that we can agree to about how to proceed. Normally. In the case of a dispute over a resource, it's a, it's, a dis, it's a disagreement over who gets to control this resource. So we're looking for a property norm. We're trying to come up with the answer to the question, who owns this thing? Who has the right to control it? Even if it's each other's bodies, like I want to be your slave or you are, I want you to be my slave. I'm sorry. And I, I, you know, you, you, if you're just a naked criminal and you just do it without trying to justify it, you don't try to justify it in the first place. You, then you have a war. Of all against all, and we're not engaged in justification. We're just engaged in self-defense. Or as Hans says, Hans Hoppe says, uh, now we have merely a technical problem. So to the extent other people are willing to sit down with us and try to find a civilized rule or rational basis for what the rule should be, okay, then they're sitting down with each other, and by doing that, they're recognizing each one owns their bodies. Okay, so. You can't have a real argument with someone else unless there's a recognition of the right to control your body because when you're trying to persuade someone by the force of reason, what you're saying is if you disagree with me, I'm not going to bash you in the head. I'm not trying to coerce you into agreeing with me. I'm trying to persuade you by the force of reason alone, 
So implicit in that is the sort of negotiated agreement that I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to harm you if you don't agree with me. And that is a recognition of the property rights in the other person. And more importantly, each person in the argument is also assuming he owns his own body. Like he wants to keep his own body. He doesn't want to be molested and to be controlled. And he's assuming he has the right to live and the right to engage in this discussion and the right to have gotten there in the first place by somehow surviving off the land and off resources that he's had to control in the world. So if he's assuming he has the right to live basically or the right to control his own body, then if you start from the beginning, there's no reason to say that he's treated differently than the other guy. In other words, you can't make what Hoppe calls or what Kant calls a particularistic argument. They have to be universalizable. You have to you have to come up with rules that could be universal to everyone involved. Otherwise, you're not making an argument at all. You're not appealing to reason. So if I say, well, I get to own you as my slave because I'm me and you're you, that's really no different than just saying I'm going to attack you if I can beat you. So it's not really a real argument. If you simply say the rules are different for me than they are for you, then you're not having a real argument. So you have to assume that the arguments have to be general and universalizable. So if I claim that I have rights to my own body, I can't coherently claim that you don't have the rights to your body unless I have a good reason to distinguish us because all we know is that we're both human actors. We're both… Intelligent, we're both having a conversation with each other, we're walking around the earth, we're trying to control our own lives. We're identical in every respect except for the fact that we're I'm me and you're you. And we you, you can't distinguish you can't make up a rule that treats A and B differently unless there's a reason to treat them differently. Because that's just not giving a reason and it's not a real argumentation. So the ultimate reason is that argumentation presupposes a type of what's called universalizability. You're presupposing that you're going to give a general reason that appeals to the, the real facts of the world and that doesn't arbitrarily distinguish people from who, who, uh, because of who they are. Otherwise, you could simply say, I get to own you because I'm me and you're not me. And of course, you could say the same thing, and then we're fighting again. <laughs> and so it defeats the entire purpose of argument, which is to come uh, find a conflict free way for us to get along with each other. So – and what Hoppe points out is that no one can deny this either, what I just said. They can't deny that without contradiction because if you start denying this, then what are you saying? Are you saying that, well, we're having an argument, but it's not a real argument, that I, if I don't like what you're saying at the end of it, I can pull my gun out and just blow you away? So mm-hmm. are you, am I really trying to persuade you by the force of reason? So any real argument does take seriously – the respect for each other's bodily integrity it has to. Otherwise, it's not a real argument, and that's the core of the libertarian idea, each other's bodily integrity, and you can build on that to get the entire uh, corpus of libertarian principles. Um, and I guess um, – so really, uh, I mean what we're saying is that we have a perform- – it, it leads to a performative contradiction if you deny, if you deny those things, correct, or, or am I wrong on that? You're right, and, and here's the thing about that. So you will have people that are skeptical of this type of argument okay, by Hoppe and others, and they'll say, well, so what? It's a program of contradiction, but that, that doesn't stop anyone from hurting you. It doesn't force people to respect your rights, and that's all true, but all, all they're trying to do, it seems to me, is they're trying to prove that rights aren't self-enforcing. Okay, They're trying to show that there's a difference between rights and between causal facts. In other words… It's not possible for you or for me to violate a causal law like the law of gravity. You just can't do it. But it is possible to violate um, a, a, a moral law or a normative law like you should not kill someone. You could still do it. And it seems to me that they have, they have gotten so um, enthralled with the idea of the state coming in as a technocratic agent, which is supposed to solve all of our problems and is to be the source of our law. That they think that if someone can get away with committing a crime or they can commit a crime even, 
that that shows somehow that the, um, there was no right in the first place. Like if I'm able to murder someone, it just proves that there was no right to life because they're, they're equating causal laws like the laws of physics and the laws of science. They're equating those with normative laws. Like they're not satisfied with a law that could be broken. Um, so in a sense, they're monists or they're scientistic, which is a criticism of Mises and Hayek and some of the Austrians, because they're basically saying, look, I can't violate the law of gravity. So if your if your moral laws don't prevent criminals from committing crimes, then what good are they? So they're changing the subject a little bit, you see. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I would say is that what's important to recognize is that when you say that – when you observe that someone has to create a – engage in a performative contradiction to deny the coherence of libertarian rights or libertarian principles, what you're doing is you're showing that they can't justify their position. And to people that are used to this nice and neat technocratic solution everything, that's not good enough for them. They want a guarantee. Well, there are no guarantees because – you can't – because people have free will, and they can and they will violate rights on occasion. The question is which laws could be in, put in practice, institutionalized, right? instituted mm-hmm. that are justified, and that justified means viewed as legitimate by the people who care about that, which is the bulk of society. The bulk of society cares about living in society in a civilized fashion with each other. There will be criminals. There will be outliers. There will be outlaws. But the question is not what they think. It really doesn't matter what they think. If they do not agree with us on the basic principles, then they're, they have to be treated as animals or technical problems, and it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a problem of criminal law. So the question okay. is when you point out that there's a practical contradiction, what you're observing is that this attempted proof, say, to justify a socialistic law fails because it's not coherent. So the entire purpose of the Hoppian view is to show no socialist ethic, and I'm using socialism in the general way Hans does, which is any institutionalized aggression against people's bodies or property. No such law could ever be justified coherently in an argumentation because argumentation is always peaceful, and it presupposes the capitalist norms, the libertarian norms. Um, and that is why you could only ever justify um, rules that comply with what people are actually doing when they're engaged in an argument, which is peaceful cooperation with each other. Okay. Yeah, and I think you're talking about estoppel a few minutes ago. I mean, that sort of seems like that that plays right into that whole concept because um, you're, you want to have your cake and eat it too. You want to say – you can't apply this. You know, you you can't you can't say that you own yourself that you have property rights, but yet you can act and pretend as though you do when you're dealing with me. Um, I I know from from talking to some different people on social media, Facebook, uh, there's an idea that it, what you were exactly what you were just now saying. If I steal your if I can steal your car, well, you don't own it because I stole it and yeah. now I own it. Yeah. <laughs> and and while and while while you may have stolen my car, rightfully the car is still mine, and I and I'm yeah. probably do some some remedy, uh, and and that that's justifiable to anybody that that knows what happened in that situation, and the, and um, so I can I can definitely understand where you're coming from. There makes a lot of sense. Um, well, are actually, you familiar? so um, you know, let me make make a point there. Um, you know, even Mises. Um, and, and others, uh, they have some comments where they're, they're, they're more careful about their terminology and their conceptual distinctions. So Mises, for example, distinguishes between catal- what he calls catalactic ownership and juristic ownership. And what he meant by that was catalactic just means the economic way that we control things in the world, and, and juristic means legal. And so ownership – is used in um, in different ways, and it leads to equivocation and confusion sometimes. So, ownership, in a legal sense, means the legally recognized right to control something. But when we use it in economic terms, or in, uh, we we just mean controlling something. That's why there's a 
debate in, in Bitcoin circles about whether you own a Bitcoin. Uh, in my view, you can't legally own a Bitcoin because it's not a physical resource. It's just mm-hmm. it's just it's an entry on a ledger that's distributed among other people's computers. In a practical sense, you have the right to con- you have the ability to control it. Um, so if you start using the word ownership, um, so so at least in this car problem you talked about, if someone steals my car, the right way to look at it as a libertarian and as an Austrian is that you still have the legally recognized ownership of the car, the right to control it, even though someone else took it. So someone else has the physical possession of the car, but you have the ownership of the car. And then, and then if you make that clear, which is clear, then you will have your opponents – they'll resort to a third tactic, which is they'll say, well, then what good is ownership? In other words, what good is it? But that's a different, that's a different claim than the claim that they're the same thing. So they keep changing their grounds. They keep shifting their grounds, and they become almost legal positivists. And they're saying, what good are these airy-fairy rights if people can reg- disregard them? And I want to say, well, blame God you know, uh, because people <laughs> have free will, and you can come up with rules and norms that we tell people what they should and should not do, but that's not going to physically prevent them from doing that. Right. Yeah, and that that's a thank you. I mean that that was very uh that was educational. That that helps to break uh that down into something that is more specific in, in its language. It definitely it would help helps with understanding uh some of the things we're talking about too. Um I guess one question that David and I have thought about have have you and and I you probably have. Have you heard of a group called the Propertarian Institute? Is that the group associated with Kurt Doolittle in uh, Ukraine or something like that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of it. I, I know Kurt. I've met Kurt. Um, I haven't associated with uh, him in some time, but I'm vaguely familiar with aspects of that. Um, my, my vague impression last time I had any contact was that he was uh, – um, uh, well, I don't think he's got a clear uh, set of ideas that are even analyzable – but to the extent I can understand them, they're they're not libertarian. He's um, he, he's just, he's kind of like a uh, he's a poor man's alt white alt right figure or something. I don't know. Well, <laughs> the, which is which they, is not they a compliment. Ten, well, yeah. well, they they have, sort of have a, a they hold a, a similar position to where we were discussing the the idea that you know. Um, if if you can't enforce your rights, then what good are they? You don't really have rights, yeah. you know. Or I told you, and, and, and another. I smell these people. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. What did you What did you say, uh, Stefan? Oh, I just said I I yeah that's exactly that's what I was saying earlier. I I can I can predict the way these people think. I've heard this so many times. If you can't enforce your yes. rights, what good are they? Yeah. Right, and so and so another another uh, thing that I've heard in, at times is that um, Austrian economics and, and libertarian political philosophy, in a lot of ways, is uh, I think the term was a justification philosophy yes. or argument. Um, and so it was a problem because we're trying to justify something, and it is very very in a, in a lot of ways very scientific, like you were talking about, very very much like a positivist. Sort of yeah. way, both maybe even legally too, as well. I don't, I don't know if. Yeah, I think I think if they you've are had any chance legal, to run in with. Yeah, I think they are like a, it's a combination of legal and logical positivism. Um, uh, and Jan Lester, who I mentioned earlier, he has this view that he's opposed to justificationism. So he has this. Now he's not anything like the propertarians, as far as I view. Although I think he speaks it anyway. Um, um, I, I don't have to say about these guys. I just think that they look. From a libertarian point of view, I'm a principled libertarian, and I have no – I make no apologies for that. That's what I've done for 25, 30 years, um, and I oppose aggression, and that means something. Now, you can have definitions of it. You can have implications of it. You can have applications. Uh, you can have arguments about the best way to justify this stuff, but it means something to be a libertarian, and it means to me to favor the – to oppose aggression. And I define aggression in a certain way, which is basically based upon a, a kind of Lockean theory of property rights. So aggression to me means using someone's justly 
owned property without permission. That's what it means. And then how they own it is either if it's their body, they own it unless they've committed a, a horrible crime, um, or if it's an external resource, then you determine it by original acquisition and contract principles. Okay, so that's the core of libertarian philosophy. Now, almost everyone in the world shares these views to some extent because we all agree with the first person who gets something owns it, and you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't murder. We agree in property rights. It's just that libertarians are extremely um, obsessed with being consistent about this, and everyone else makes exceptions, and they usually do it because of the, the mythology under, uh, that surrounds the state, this idea that we have to make an exception for the state. In other words, it's, it's, they, they agree with private morals that we all agree with, private law. Basquiat pointed this out in the 1800s, right? That 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 the idea is that just because a group of people come together doesn't make something right that one person couldn't do by themselves. But most people accept that fallacy for some reason. They think that because of the public goods problem or the free rider problem or something about the way human nature is, you have to have a state that has extra power than is treated specially and can do certain things. That we're not normally permitted to do, right? Which is why taxation is not theft, even though it really is. Things like that. But all this just means is that everyone is basically libertarian to the extent that they are, and then they make exceptions. And what they, the way they do it, and conservatives and li and liberals do this, or, or leftists do this, and the propertarians do this, which is what I'm getting to. What they say is this. Yes, 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 yes. I agree with you libertarians that liberty is an important value. Or if you force them, they'll say, yes, aggression is normally bad. I'm against aggression in general. And then they come up with their, their exception, which is, but it's not the only value. So this is the cry of the status is that whenever you hear someone say that liberty is not the only value, hold on to your wallet because they're coming after it. Whenever someone says, I'm in favor of property rights, but that's not the only thing that matters, hold on to your wallet because they're coming after it. And that's what these guys do, like Kurt Doolittle and, and these, these so-called propertarians, which is horrible they've corrupted this name because um, I like the word propertarian as a better name than libertarianism, but they apparently started to ruin it. Um, they say that, well, liberty is not the only value. There's other things. You have to look at history, and there's the white race and all this. That's all their bullshit, which is just their excuse for saying at some point, in this case, aggression is okay. So in other words, they will concede in a grudging kind of half-hearted way. Yeah, I'm against aggression too. I'm just – it's not my only value. But when you say being against aggression is not your only value, all you're saying is that in some cases I favor aggression. So in that case, you're, you're a technical problem, and you're my enemy. Because the only thing we really believe in as libertarian is the, 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 you know, the inviolability of the non-aggression principle. Aggression is never justified, and that's the essence of Hoppe's argumentation ethics. It's to show that you cannot justify aggression, and the reason is because all justification is argumentative justification. It has to be, and no one can disagree with that without falling into contradiction. And because yeah. that justification is argumentative, it happens during the course of an actual argumentation, which is a physical situation between people that have control over their own bodies, and both parties have to recognize and respect that. So it's just impossible to come up with an argument for anything that justifies aggression without falling into self-contradiction, which means you can never have an argument for aggression. You can't justify it. You can commit it, but you right. can't justify it. So and I, especially I if you want to work together with other people. Is the same. Say again? Oh, I said especially – I mean you, you, can, you can try to justify certain things. You, you think you can justify – you can't justify aggression. What, what you, if you want to work with other people, then there, you, justification is necessary. You, you need to be able to justify this is why we need to work together and then do it. You know, so some justification. The, the thing that I keep hearing is that you know you're just trying to justify this and you're just trying to justify that. Sometimes justification is necessary. 
Yeah, and the word the word justification is um, has a little bit of ambiguity in it too because it just means um, sometimes people think of it they mean rationalization like that's the argument you give. Right. But what we say what we mean is it's a good argument, and we know by basic laws of philosophy, Aristotle's law of non-contradiction, that anything that's self inconsistent can't be correct. Like if you if you make an argument that says A and says not A at the same time. There's something wrong with your argument. I don't know which one it is, but there's something wrong with it. So if your argument involves a contradiction, it's, it can't be correct, and that's what we're pointing out. And this is why some people are libertarians and some are not because some of us care about consistency to an anal degree, <laughs> almost OCD fashion, almost autistic fashion, which I, <laughs> I, I raise my hand. I admit to it, and some people don't. They, they're willing to like, okay… As far as I can think, I got over my job today. I'm generally against aggression, but the police need to put down that shooter. You know, I mean, people can only go so far. But the point is that uh, that you will notice this fallacy anytime someone makes a serious, they try to make a serious argument for something that is that violates the libertarian non-aggression set of rules. They end up saying liberty is important, but but it's not the only value. They will always say that. And what that means is, in this case, I'm in favor of regression. And then they'll do this other trick, which drives me insane. If you if you corner them and you use precise terms like I try to do, and instead of saying liberty as a value, you talk about aggression, and you define it carefully in terms of property rights, then they will always say this. They'll say something like, well, you're not against aggression either because you, after all, you believe that you can uh, use force against someone trying to attack you. It's like that's self-defense, you idiot. That's not aggression. We just have this straight. So they will always play these tricks, and I don't know if they're stupid or dishonest or just what, but I get this all the time. It drives me insane. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And the the thing that, that – that's that's one of the things you know, there there is a difference between being a, a pacifist and thinking in terms of you know not being a, a, an aggressive uh, uh violently aggressive towards other people. You, you just one does not necessarily lead to the other. It's, it's really more or less a non sequitur. You know, and people, I've, I've had people actually say that to me. Oh, are you some kind of pacifist? But you know, it well, it and I actually, equal. so I think this is kind of a proof that libertarianism is the is the strongest moral view. Is because it's compatible with everything else. People could live in a socialist commune if they want, as long as it's voluntary, right? So. Our society would not prohibit you from living like a bunch of commies on a, on a, on a, on a kibbutz or whatever, um, and it also wouldn't prohibit you from being pacifist. You could be pacifist if you want, and even the pacifist has no good argument against libertarianism because we believe in the uh, legitimacy of, of self-defense, and some of us believe in the legitimacy of, of retaliation as well, retribution. Um, they can't argue against that because… <laughs> They can't do anything about it by their own rules. They have to sit there and just be <laughs> quiet, right? So they're not going to say that it's legitimate for force to be used to stop me from using force against an aggressor. So they have no teeth in their argument against self-defense. So they can be ignored as just uh, uh, amusing, amusing idiots who get to survive off of you know, the fruits of capitalism, which rests upon the right to self-defense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Um, so I guess, and then we come down to there. I've seen a lot of people that have talked about, and of course, for several years now, you see a lot of physical removal stuff going around. You know, Hoppe talked about uh, sometimes it's necessary to physically remove certain individuals, but I think that goes back to uh, the non-aggression principle. People who refuse to adhere to it, and, and I think that's where, where we end up with that. And I don't know. That's that was my own personal take on it. Maybe you could say something about that in our, you know, before you well, take off on us. Sure, on the physical move stuff. First of all, I would say that that's, that's technically not part of his argumentation. I think that was more of a later analysis of um, of a few things: uh, cultural conservatism and also trying to imagine what a private law society or a free society would look like, um, and what would be the aftermath of, say, the implosion of democracy and. I think the idea was that you wouldn't have public spaces, so to speak. Everything would be private, and people would 
uh, voluntarily associate, associate in certain ways, um, and partly geographically, right? They live among each other. They live in territories. Um, and I think he talked about what he called covenant communities. I think he was saying that there's a certain understanding in a given area of what our private rules are, maybe that are in addition to the basic libertarian norms. Like maybe in this area everyone agrees to dress in a certain conservative way or to be Catholic or whatever. Um, and you could have voluntary places like that, and people could ostracize each other, or they could just voluntarily live among people that they like, which people tend to do nowadays anyway. They live among like people in some ways, and they, they have some mixture. They have trade with each other, but people tend to live among other people. The physical removal part, I think what he was getting at was this. He was saying that in a private law society, which you can think of as an anarchist, libertarian, free society in the future, the predominant ethic among everyone in that society would be the libertarian ethic, which is that private property rights are good. And the family unit is good because that's a natural outcome of the way people live. Um, capitalism and free trade are good. Prosperity is good. All these sort of normal Western capitalist values taken to their libertarian extremes. So that would be the predominant ethic, and someone who was opposed to that, like who was loudly proclaiming for socialism and saying we should set up a government and we should let it tax people, these people would be close to a threat because they're trying to get started this monster thing called the state that we have now that we've somehow successfully defeated. So these types of people would not be welcome is what he's saying. No one would want to live among them. They tend to be… Losers and ostracized and forcibly removed, which means people don't want to live near them. So I think that's what he was getting at. He didn't mean that uh, that if someone merely has a different opinion than you or their their uh, heterodox and their uh, and their cultural perspectives or or whatever that you could physically uh, assault them and, and eject them from their homes. What he meant was that people mm -hmm. tend to want to live among each among like-minded people, and the same goes for libertarian justice. You know. If you live in a in a in a in, a, in an area, you're going to need to associate with people. You're going to need to have contracts with people. You're going to need to respect their property rules and vice versa. You're going to need to have insurance. And to get insurance, you're going to have to comply with the rules of the insurance companies, which are going to be the rules that limit liability and restrict risky behavior. So people that are complete outliers are not going to tend to be able to get insurance. They're not going to have any friends. They're not going to have any help. They're not going to have a lot of business. They're going to tend to be ostracized by the way they act, which is the way life works now. So it's just pointing at that, I believe. Okay. So, so in a lot of ways, it, it, it kind of points out the fact that people will tend to gravitate towards like-minded people, and there will be occasions where maybe there's some disagreements or so on. Uh, maybe you have somebody you're, – you're in a, a – Covenant community that has private property rights, as we mentioned, more libertarian minded, and someone comes in under the auspices of I am just like you, and then after they're there for a year or so, they begin to espouse more communist or socialistic ideas, then you would be able to probably – it would be a good idea to physically remove them. Simply for one thing, uh, if, if they knew when they came into the community these were the standards and they didn't – they sort of kept that secret – and then later began to espouse these opposing ideas, then physically remove them. Possibly. Well, and again, maybe under that scenario, you, if, if they moved in with, if they moved into a, to a neighborhood with a certain restrictive covenant which says that we only allow Catholics here or we only allow libertarians here or whatever, then if they violate the contract, they violate the contract. I don't expect that to be the normal way of human life. To be honest, in the future, I think it'd be very cosmopolitan and diverse. Um, but I think what he's imagining is not just like like people living – like Catholics living by Catholics and maybe Italians living in, by Italians and Chinese living by Chinese. He's imagining in a future libertarian world where the predominant ethic is libertarian. Then okay. libertarians, which is everyone, people that favor liberty only want to associate with people that also believe in liberty, and when someone starts trying to advocate… For the use of force to under to under you know to, to tear apart this libertarian order and to start setting up a police force that would arrest people for smoking marijuana or for having the wrong religion, these people would start being heavily shunned and you know hopefully 
the society would be resilient enough where the libertarian spirit would, would, would shout them down. Yes, and they would have to go live with the hippies who were losers. I mean you don't want them to be part of your culture because we want to promote liberty, and we want that to be the basic assumed norm. We want everyone to right. respect private property rights. So the basic idea is that people that you know, let, let me give an example. The, 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 as Hoppe believes, and as most people probably common sense believe, the predominant order of, of of any successful human society would be the family-based unit, the kind of culturally conservative mother, father, kids, whatever. Yeah, there are going to be some homosexuals. There are going to be some priests who are like – there are going to be some bachelors who never get married. They're all living in the same society with each other, but you don't have a priest. The priest doesn't go to mass every Sunday and bash all the married people for being married and being heterosexual. He doesn't attack the family unit, which is the basis of society, which provide, pays the light bills for his church. He's a priest, right? That's his role. Mm-hmm. He decided to do that. That's fine. He's welcome in society, but he's not. His role is not to advocate under to everyone become a priest and the human race die off, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, people that are hostile to the very fabric of, of 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 libertarian society are people that I guess the ideas would tend to be ostracized. By the way, this is not my. I, I'm not the guy that runs around talking cultural conservative fire breathing stuff. Um, I get asked questions about this. This was part of Hoppe's. Um, this part of Hoppe's theory, which he developed, I think, when he was talking about democracy, and he was trying to show why democracy is not the um, the leap forward in social progress that everyone takes it for granted to be. Like when we moved from the old world to the monarchistic societies, to the modern state, to the democratic states. It's not necessarily an improvement. That was basically his argument, and he he was trying to show that when you went from monarchies, the old world style monarchies, to the democratic systems, it's worse in many ways. And he held up as a model like imagine what a monarch's incentives would be to maintain the value of his country and to you know have quality control over who's immigrating and things like that. And what what democratic politicians. Have any sense to do? He was basically mounting a critique of modern democratic statism by showing that it's even worse than monarchies. But he's not in favor of monarchies, and part of that went into a cultural critique of the way immigration works now and how it's even worse than it would be under a monarch system. But he's in favor of an anarchistic private property system, which most of us libertarians are as well. Right, with with covenant communities, which will give you know freedom of association, disassociation, that sort of thing, based on whatever whatever it is that people want to do that based. I mean, on. it has to be because if you if you're in favor of private property, you have to be in favor of contract law, you have to be in favor of the freedom of association, and just by empirical observation, we can observe that people tend to associate in certain ways, nationalistically, ethnically, by language, you know, by uh, cultural values. Um, mm-hmm. We have to expect that's going to continue to happen, and but the the main point is that in a future libertarian world, one of the main values would be the libertarian ethic itself, the private property, and so that people that were hostile to that would be the ones that are dangerous. Right, that makes and that that makes perfect sense. That those those people, if they're hostile to non-aggression, they're obviously one aggression. Um, so I, I guess. We are coming up at that. We're we're just a little over that hour mark, and I know you said that that that's where you wanted to be, uh, Stefan. But I'd like to give David the last question if he has one. You know, to, to before we wrap up with the show. Um, what do you think of some um, libertarians, such as Austin Peterson and maybe others, um, criticism of the uh, non-aggression principle? Um, I actually think I've seen some of that stuff. Um, I mean, look, I don't take it that seriously because it's not very good, everything I've seen. Um, I think there's a distinction in my mind between uh, what, it, what, what it means to be libertarian to me is to hold a certain set of beliefs or values. Um, it's, but other libertarians are more of the activist, the political activist mentality, and 
they think being a libertarian means being an activist, trying to go out there and usually through the political process to make change. You can have a disagreement among libertarians about uh, uh, or discussion about what the best ways to achieve change are, but even to have that discussion, you're assuming that part of the purpose of being a libertarian is to try to make change happen in the world. Not everyone agrees with that. Some people just want to be left alone. They want to contemplate. They want to be good people. They want to be on the right side of history. They want to do the right thing, but they don't, they don't all necessarily believe that it's possible to change things. I, I personally am skeptical of the idea that we're going to achieve a libertarian revolution by handing out pamphlets to our uncles at Thanksgiving dinners. Okay, um, I, I think there's a reason why we don't have full liberty right now. It's sort of a political choice reason, I think. Um, and then the question is, can we ever have full liberty? And in a way, we can never have full liberty because people have free will, and even if we have a libertarian society, there's always a chance of a random criminal who's going to violate someone's rights, and they'll get away with it, or they'll commit the crime. Um, so being a libertarian just means being in favor of, maybe hoping for, a certain set of conditions that would lead to more liberty. I don't think the political process is a way to do it, and I, in fact, I think it tends to corrupt people and make them become way more pragmatic and compromise. Um, like people like Austin Peterson probably do, and almost everyone in the Libertarian Party, because they're already buying into the idea of voting and democracy and the legitimacy, legitimacy of the American Constitution and the founding fathers, even though they had slaves. I mean, the the whole thing is hard, you know. I mean, I'm so sick of seeing the Statue of Liberty or the Liberty Bell in American Constitution Declaration documents. These guys being held up as if they're some kind of proto-libertarian avatars. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that America has become the, uh, the, the, the place where libertarianism sort of started because everyone associates it, the original American government with this, and which makes them minarchists because, you know, at best there was a state. Um, and once you agree with the state and all these powers that the government does, then you're going to compromise your principles, and you're not going to ha you're not going to want the non-aggression principle because the non-aggression principle basically outlaws the state. <laughs> um, I hmm. think L. Neil Smith. It was either in the Galatin Divergence or the Probability Brooch, two of his best novels. Um, one of those, there's some. It's an alternate history, and he makes, one, if I recall, he makes one change in history, and that was that. During the drafting of the Declaration, uh, Jefferson left the word – or put the word unanimous in. You had to have the unanimous consent of the governed. So he just inserted one word in that history differently than in ours, and because the word unanimous was in there, it basically led to anarchy because you have to have unanimous consent. You can't have the majority govern the minority who loses an election or whatever, right? Um, and of course that is the libertarian goal, and the libertarian implication is that you can't have a state… If you really believe in the non-aggression principle, and that's probably why uh, quasi-status uh, – some people call them minarchists. I like to call them minarchists mini-status because they still believe in the state. Uh, they're just a smaller <laughs> version of the state. So I'm not surprised that mini-status end up being status and opposed to the non-aggression principle, which would outlaw the state that they, that they favor. Um, I've heard good things about Austin. I don't know him very well myself. Um, he, he, would, he may well be an anarchist in his heart. I don't know. But um, the criticisms I've heard from him and people like him of the non-aggression principle are usually by people who either want to have some kind of government, and they know that the non-aggression principle can't fit with that, or it's by people that are these urban – these sophisticates who want this to be a continuing game. Um, I don't want to name any names. I could, I could name a couple. Some of these, uh, some of these Cato-friendly – Scholars who think they're way too sophisticated for Rothbard and his radicalism, and um, you know they want there to be a conversation always, and we don't be radicals. And um, you know the non-aggression principle is just not what sophisticated people believe in anymore. You know, and I'll tell you, my my view is when anyone tells me they're against the non-aggression principle, you know, my my trigger finger gets itchy because <laughs> if you're not against not if, if if you're not against aggression. That means you're for aggression, and that means you're a threat. Okay, so the only people I really trust are people that – pacifists are fine with me and anyone who disavows all aggression. But if you're not willing to disavow aggression on some kind of trumped-up argument, then you, you know I, I think we need to keep our eye on you when you're around the silverware. <laughs> that's that's an interesting 
put it because that's right. I think I think if you are not willing to at least uh, try to apply the non-aggression principle uh, in in your dealings with other people, then you have there are instances in which you will use ag- aggression, and therefore we need to be on the lookout for you. Um, well, this has been really great. It's been very informative. Um, uh, really, we we really enjoyed having you on the show with us, Stefan. Um, do you have anything up and coming that you'd like to let any of our listeners know about? Um, no, I'm just working on. I'm trying to get a book out, which is like an edited selection of my my essays and articles over the last 20 years. Uh, so that should be coming out later this year, if I uh, if I can manage to not be too lazy. But um, <laughs> uh, they'll see that on my they'll see that on my website when it comes out. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. And uh, hopefully maybe we can have you back again sometime if you're open to it. Be be glad to. Oh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, you have a good good evening, and uh, I guess this is it. we're wrapping it up, guys. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night. Yep.